Hey everyone, I hope you're all having a great long weekend. Tonight I want to talk a little bit about the cognitive information processing theory that was discussed in chapter 4 of the book. One thing that I found interesting about this was that it was discovered in the 1970s and it's still being investigated today. I just find it really interesting that it is 45 years later and they are still researching certain parts of it and still coming up with new information. And that just really intrigues me because with education in general, there's so much that we don't know and finding new things every day is just really exciting. So what is cognitive information processing theory? A cognitive approach to understanding how the brain transforms sensory information. Um, this theory has one thing in common with the behavioral theory in regards that the environment plays an important role in learning in both of these theories. So, Atkinson and Schriffen proposed this multi-stage, multi-store theory of memory, and this is the basis for the information processing theory. The three memory systems in the learner that this focuses right now on is the sensory, the short-term, and the long-term memories. These three memories are assumed to receive the information from the environment and then in turn transform it into storage and use it in memory performance. So we've all had classes that have talked about sensory memory, short term and long term memory, but as kind of a review, the sensory memory is where learners identify organized patterns in the environment and start the process of recognizing and decoding them. While the long-term memory allows the learner to store the information for just a little bit of time and then connect it with the information that is already in the long-term memory. And then we move on to the long-term memory which permits the learner to remember and apply information long after it was originally learned. So this is stuff that we already know and that we've talked about a lot and I just wanted to kind of review it before we moved on to the processes. So the three processes that it talks about are attention, encoding, and retrieval. Now these are thought to act upon information as it is received and transformed and stored for later recall and use. So the book talks about how learners that don't pay attention will never receive the information to be learned in the first place. Um, this makes perfect sense, but sometimes I see in my classroom there's a student that I do not think is paying attention to me whatsoever. He's twirling around at his head, he's spinning on the carpet, and I call on him to kind of test him and see, okay, are you listening? Are we paying attention here? And he can tell me exactly what I just talked about word for word with every detail that I set it in. Now, I do believe that there are exceptions to the rules such as this child, but I know that if I'm not paying attention to something, I'm not really going to get all of the information that I need to learn. So I do believe that there are exceptions such as that child, but maybe he's listening in his own little way. And um, the second is encoding. This provides a way that learners can make personal and meaningful connections between new information and prior knowledge. I know that used to be a huge emph emphasis in reading in elementary school was making connections, background knowledge, 
it's gone away a little bit, especially um, in the younger grades. We try to put it in as much as we can, but it's kind of moving to different focuses. I still use it a lot because I find it is so important for kids to be able to make that connection with background knowledge. Um, so this process allows them to make that connection between what they know and what they're learning. And then it goes into retrieval, which allows the learners to recall information from memory so that it is able to be applied later when it's relevant. So right here I found this diagram and I found it very interesting. You have the sensory register. It goes in to the short-term memory, then in turn the long-term memory retrieves back to short-term memory. So I found this diagram really helpful for me and I'm hoping that you'll be able to find it helpful too to kind of explain with a visual cue about the information processing theory. This theory really focuses on feedback. It provides the learner with knowledge about the accuracy of their response or the sufficiency of performance. Um, but it also provides the corrective information to the learner that can be used to modify their performance. So feedback is really important. I know it is in kindergarten. I know it is in every grade level. But this theory really, really values the power of feedback. And I know that there's lots of different ways as educators that we are able to provide feedback to our students. Some of the strategies um, to incorporate, draw attention to important words by adding italics or bold fonts, and then adding color on diagrams really helps emphasize to students what is important. Um, graphics and diagrams and imagery, it helps the learners to make connections. I know that it helps me to make connections, but I know it helps the students too as well. And then lastly, the book recommends giving examples or problems in different perspectives allows learners to apply the knowledge. I know this is stuff that we all do as educators, but it's just kind of putting it into words and reminding us. Because I know I do this a lot in my classroom, but being reminded of it and explaining the reasoning and the theory behind it really helps me to understand why it is that I do this. So one thing to kind of think about and respond on, how do you use the cognitive information processing theory in your class? What aspects of it do you use? Um, how do you give feedback? Um, looking back at the strategies over here, what are things that you do when you're presenting information to your students? Um, I hope you all have a great weekend. Thanks.